Hola, everybody. Welcome back to the Chats with Yvonne podcast with me, your host, Yvonne Armenta. I talk about public speaking because I love it and I want to help you love it too. In this podcast, we dive deep into all aspects of the art to help us understand our current experience with it and inspire our future as public speakers. I like to think that my superpower is being able to connect our experiences and who we are back to why and how we experience the art of public speaking. Today's segment is you're not a public speaker like them, you're a public speaker like you. Tu cultura es tu poder. We'll meet Karina, a Latinx community advocate who understands the power in telling each individual story. If you haven't yet, I'd suggest you listen to the podcast episode, The Written History of Public Speaking. I provide a history lesson about where the art of public speaking really began and how our culturas have actually always been immersed in the art. It's a good setup for this conversation. With that being said, I'd like you to meet Karina Mora. She's a professional photographer, speaker, and podcaster devoted to helping people move past assimilation to reclaim their cultural legacies and elevating her native Mexican culture through photography and spoken word. Her podcast, Elevating La Cultura, features stories from first and second generation Latinas who are working hard, pursuing their passions, and pouring their positive efforts and benefits into the next generations. When I came across Karina on Instagram and saw that her Elevating La Cultura podcast and socials were about using our Latinx identities as our superpower rather than something that we had to turn on and off, I knew we had to chat and dive into public speaking because she herself is not only a speaker, but also someone that explores her many interests while continuously keeping her cultura at the forefront. As I always do, I ask my guests about their first time public speaking. Oh my gosh, it was in probably middle school. I had this report that I had to give and it was a presentation. And I remember everyone was like dreading it, but I was like, I'm gonna nail this. I'm gonna teach them how to do this recipe. And it was actually, I taught them how to make chorizo con papas. So me, this little little fifth grader in this class of like all white students and I didn't think anything of it because I'm like this is normal this is a family recipe I have this like every weekend so my mom helped me like get all my inflections right and like tried to make it seem like I'm drawing them in and it was exhilarating for me I was like I was up there and I was like, I nailed it. I nailed that whole recipe. And I was like, yes, I'm for sure getting an A plus. And um, I think that was the, the first time that I really enjoyed being in front of people. And I didn't understand people feeling nervous or anxious or dreading it because it was like the best time for me, even though it was like five minutes. But that is the first time that I remember loving being on, on a stage, even though it was in front of class. But I specifically remember educating people and showing them something different. I think I got an A, but it didn't matter because I had a great time presenting. And um, I think Like thinking back on that, like I'm doing that today. I'm teaching people about what is exciting to be, to me about being Mexicana and sharing that part of my life and story. So, oh, thank you for that question. That really like brought me back and got me excited all over again. I absolutely love asking this question. I won't get tired of saying that. This is literally my favorite thing ever because I find that how you started public speaking and the emotions you felt, the support you had, the community who was around you or wasn't, they're really tied to how you experience the art of public speaking today. And Karina does it all. And it's really no surprise because I think that when we're truly tapped into who we are and why our culturas are quite literally our superpower, It permeates every part of who we are and makes us better at what we do. The realization that what we often suppress in white dominated spaces is actually the thing that will liberate us from feeling stuck or uninspired or just uncomfortable is so powerful. When you can reclaim it and reconnect with your confidence, imagine how many of your talents and interests you'll feel free to explore. 
I like to say that I am multifaceted because I do a lot of things. I am a photographer in the Chicago area. I am a speaker. I specifically speak on Latinx identity and more specifically on the effects of assimilation that might be present in our lives that we don't necessarily realize until we're adults and are grappling with that. I am a homeschool mom. I have two kids and I homeschool them. I lead trips to Mexico. Uh, so I am Mexicana Americana. My family is from Guadalajara. And over the past few years, I have started bringing people to Mexico to experience the richness, the beauty of Mexico that is more than just the spring break beaches that that is portrayed on the media. Um, what else do I do? I am a, I said photographer, but I started out in wedding photography and I'll, that is like the pinnacle of my story that has led me here. But I also take pictures in Mexico and tell the stories of Mexican cities through fine art photography. I am also a podcast host. So I host Elevating La Cultura, where I elevate and showcase first, second generation stories and in that their area of expertise. So I do a lot, but all is tied to uh, elevating the Latinx identity in each part of my businesses. Karina mentioned that what started her journey in elevating cultura was while working her photography business. I have been a wedding photographer here in the Chicago area. We're going on 13 years now, but this is officially my last year. You know, COVID kind of shifted things a little bit. And so this is my last year officially doing wedding photography, but it was in 2016 that I had been doing foot wedding photography for a while now in Chicago. And I experienced a wedding that appropriated Cinco de Mayo and Mexican culture. And it was then I was actually like at the what I consider like the height of our career. Um, I owned a wedding photography business with my husband and we were like fully booked that year. I had like built our business to attract the clients that I, that I thought I wanted. And this wedding was very, very triggering. And I do did like most people like are taught to do people of color to just smile and get through it. Um, but afterwards, I really had to unpack what happened. And I had to make that decision, like, am I going to continue playing this part where people feel comfortable appropriating my own culture in front of me? Um, and is that what I want for my kids? Like, do I want to continue that legacy of, okay, well, we just have to suck it up we just have to go along with it or did I want to do something different and shift the trajectory for my family so that is the wedding that kind of shifted my career in the wedding industry I since then was organically like I stopped marketing myself as a wedding photographer and kind of organically stopped doing weddings um, the events industry is a lucrative industry. And so I also wanted to be wise about knowing that it was our income and I couldn't just like cancel everything. Um, so while I was shifting into what I wanted to do next, how I wanted to educate people, how I wanted to shift the narrative for our family, I continued in the events industry which is why like I'm still photographing weddings but uh, I, over the past specifically two three years I've gotten more clear on what I want to do as far as like business uh, which is why I now have a podcast we're working on a studio space that will be open hopefully by the end of the year and I'm doing more speaking 
so that way like these stories can be told and like there are real instances still in 2022 where things like this are happening and so we need to be talking about it so that way we as like i'm a millennial so as this generation is looking forward to the next generation we have the tools in our belt to kind of shift the narrative for them how often does that happen when someone is so clearly appropriating our cultures and we're almost confused about how to react in the moment but at our core we just know it feels wrong staying silent while it's happening can be a form of self-preservation to be honest there's so much to unpack here But what I will say is that in the instances where I've experienced microaggressions or felt that my culture was somehow being used against me, I personally didn't say anything in the moment, went home and reflected on it, and would come in the next day and address it. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Karina's turning point was the wedding. There was a realization that she was helping create these memories for people on what was their special day, but it didn't feel right because she knew that they were appropriating her culture without even considering or caring about the lived experiences of the people in that culture. Those people were not the right people to tell the story. And before that story though, and Karina's decision to say, ya basta, there were years of feeling different and left out throughout her upbringing. I was born here in the United States, in the suburbs of Chicago. And I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago in predominantly white neighborhoods, white suburbs. And it was, this is something that I I touch on when I do speak, because I think it's so important to understand the history of our country and where we were at the time. So my parents were born like in the 60s, uh, late 50s. My mother was born here in Chicago. My father was born in Mexico. He immigrated when he was in his teens. And so when they got married and had kids, they moved to the suburbs. Chicago was a, at the time, not, my parents didn't want to live in Chicago and raise kids there. So they moved to the suburbs and it was a predominantly white space and during that time that I was growing up it was very much like color blindness was being promoted it was like okay we just don't talk about any diversity except the diversity was me I was not there weren't many other brown kids in my class there were it was predominantly white there were a few other people of color but we just didn't talk about it And it was maybe in middle school that I started getting comments, like people knew that I spoke Spanish. So they would say like, oh, can you teach me how to say this? Do you know any, you know, bad words? Do you know, like, it was like a game to them. And so at that point, I was like, you want to fit in, like in middle school, you're just like, okay, I'm going to stop speaking Spanish. I'm not going to say anything. Um, But then they would ask me like, well, what do you have for Thanksgiving? What kind of food do you have for Christmas? Do you have tamales? And I was like, why am I the one being asked these questions? Like, I thought I was just like you. And so it was during middle school that I started to see that distinction, especially because I'm, and I'm so thankful for this. My father would make it a point for us to visit family every summer. And so I would come back and have my summer glow on and it was very much like oh look let's compare tans let's see who's tanner and being tan was like trendy or in you know the at that time the girls were wanting to go get tans and I'm over here like well this is this doesn't come off like this is my normal skin and um it just got a little bit more uh like in high school is when I was like, okay, well, what can I do to make sure I don't feel different? Like, that's when you want to be like blend in, you want to 
be part of something, but you always like, there's always this distinction, at least for me, there was in predominantly white spaces, like there's always that one question or, um, or I can't pronounce your name or why do you go to Mexico? And it continued in college. I also was in a very predominantly white university and it was like, oh, you're going to Mexico. Are you just going to go drink? Like, what do you do? Like, are you going to get a tan? Like, what do you eat? And I'm like, these are strange questions. And so it was always that, um, that duality. You know, I was one person with my family. Like, we spoke Spanish. We um, went to Mexico to visit family every year, sometimes twice a year. But when I was back in the States in school, I was as, as white presenting as I could in my speech, in my academics, in when I was with other people, so as to not be that person that stuck out. And so this was the mentality that I was raised with as well, because even when I would have friends over, my parents would be like, okay, no Spanish, because we don't want them to feel uncomfortable like we're talking about them. So it was very confusing but at the time it was normal and you didn't know that it was wrong or confusing you just that's just how it was and so it wasn't until I think it was that wedding that I was like this is not how it should be like how did I get here how did I assimilate so well that people are comfortable appropriating my culture right in front of me. This was also around um, 2016. So the political climate was shifting a bit. So people were being a little bit more vocal um, and social media was already present. So the conversations were already starting. And so that was like the catapult to me making that um, those observations of my upbringing to understand how I got to this place and then asking myself, how am I going to move forward so my kids don't have to feel this dual identity that is like at war with ourselves. Being as white presenting as you could. That's often how we feel that we need to show up as public speakers. If I look back at even my outfits, I realize that's what I was trying to do. I had this idea of what professionalism was and I thought it was far from who I was normally. With added layers of being young, being a woman, I tried to emulate what I saw others on stage wearing. And damn, do I wish I would have worn what made me feel comfortable. What I felt expressed who I was. But maybe like Arina said, we don't want to make others feel uncomfortable because we feel like we're the ones that are different on the stage in this example. And therefore, we assimilate and make changes to ourselves at the expense of our own discomfort. We are often told that we have to be uncomfortable to make sure that other people don't feel uncomfortable around us. And that takes a lot of unlearning to do, to not be in that place anymore. And Karina asks herself, how did I get here? How did I assimilate so well that people are comfortable appropriating my culture right in front of me? Have you ever experienced that? She talks about this dual identity at war with ourselves, where when we're in one place, we have to act a certain way, but then when we're in the other, we have to act a different way. And when we're home, we act one way and that's who we are. But when we're taking on the stage, having our first jobs, we feel like we have to be what everybody else is. Because otherwise, it can feel like you won't get those opportunities. Like you won't be able to get your foot in the door if you don't act like everybody else. I grew up in a neighborhood where people looked like me, talked like me. When I got to college, that's when I started to feel different than who I saw every day. I was like, where are my people at? When I started working in, the, in what I'll call the real world, that's where I started being like, okay, I have to dress a certain way. Also, there's this added layer of if I don't dress this way, if I don't act this way, if I don't, to some extent, assimilate, 
then not only is that going to be a perception of who I am as a person, right, to everybody else, maybe not get my foot in the door to something that I thought was a good opportunity, but people also judge my entire community. So whether I liked it or not, I always felt like, si, me, si voy al trabajo toda mechuda, that's a representation of not only me, but other Latinas. And at a time when we're struggling to get our foot in the door, I was like, I don't want to mess this up for anybody else either. That's a lot of freaking pressure to put on yourself, by the way. All of this gives us perspective into the work that Karina does today. A quote on her Instagram says, I wish that someone could have told me that I could actually be proud of being Mexican and include that part of me as I create. How has this helped her show up as a creative and as a speaker? Yes. So because I was in mostly white spaces when I grew up, everything that I did was compared to whiteness. Um, and that was even the simple thing of going to Mexico and maybe coming back a little tanner than when I left. And I remember this one comment. Um, it was made by someone that I was a, a parent of someone I was dating at the time. And she was like, wow, you're just so dark. She's like, I can't believe how dark you got in just a week. She's like, look, you, compared to me, you're, you're almost black. And I remember feeling so strange, like uncomfortable in that situation. But if someone else who were white were to go and get a tan, it wouldn't have been that much of a, a deal. It'd be like, oh great, you're looking great, you're, you're getting a tan. And I know this because I had my peers doing the exact same thing, but getting different responses. And so this same lady also made this comment of like, oh, well, it'd be okay if you ended up with my son, if you guys got married, because your family's the good Mexicans. And so it was always these comments where I was compared to whiteness. I was made to feel good when other people felt comfortable around me. And so that narrative told me that me being Mexican or showing up as Mexican, wearing my hair braided with ribbons or wearing um, a shirt that was colorful was too much. Me wearing red lipstick was too much. And so with that narrative, I didn't show up as myself. I put on a different um, identity when I was in those situations, whether it was for school, um, on, on stages, um, presenting in my business as a wedding photographer. I was always two different people. And so I wish that someone told someone would have told me like no it's okay if you want to wear your braids like do that if you want to wear lipstick it's not unprofessional you can do that if you want to speak spanglish it's okay you can do that so that is what i mean like showing up as who you were raised like your culture like is okay and that it's not unprofessional. I think about the um, people who are like designers for companies and I think about like how much they have to like hold themselves back because they're in predominantly white spaces and the people making the decisions are going to say, well, this design is maybe too much. It's not for our audience. So that is what I mean, like, I, I think the more we have these conversations and actually make the assessments of the lies that we have been told, the, the more freedom that people will have moving forward in their home life, in their personal lives, in their work life. And I think we are 
slowly but surely moving towards that diversity that um, we're having the conversations of the reality that these negative narratives have made on people's lives. And I'm hoping that the more we talk about it, companies will be willing to listen. And I think the more we tell ourselves and our peers that it's okay to be us, that it's not unprofessional, that it's just us living our lives, then more people will be willing to accept that. Everything that we do is compared to whiteness. How often do we do that to ourselves because we've learned that that is the standard? Really think about it. And this taps into our conversation with Ariana last time and decolonizing even our own minds and our own beliefs. Everything that we do is compared to whiteness. Why? There are, quote, the good Mexican, as Karina mentioned, right? What does the, quote, bad Mexican, what does that even mean? And because we're compared to whiteness, we almost start to internalize the feelings of, okay, I feel good about myself when other people start to feel comfortable around me. But again, that comes at the expense of leaving a huge chunk of who you are behind. There's a pressure to be two different people. And that's what I hope that we don't do when we're up on stage. But I know that there is pressure to do that, to speak a certain way, to walk a certain way, to move your body a certain way, to dress a certain way. I've always said that oftentimes the reason we're so detached from the art of public speaking is because we fear that it asks us to be something that we're not. We think that we have to live up to a specific standard in order to be incredible public speakers and that puts us oftentimes at odds when in reality if we're able to bring our, our cultura and who we are into the public speaking space not only do we open more doors for everybody in our community but we start to see that hey our forms of communicating are already so powerful they have been for years it's how we pass down traditions cultura stories We've been doing this, y'all. And Karina says that the more we have conversations and make assessments of the lies we've been told, the more freedom we'll have across our lives. So the moment that we begin to really hone in into who we are and reflect on those experiences and start to rediscover our confidence, not only will it impact your professional life, but your personal life and everything else that you do. It's going to show up. As public speakers, why would we want to be uncomfortable? that makes us have to assimilate, right? In many cases, being uncomfortable, we're like, wait, I don't want to be uncomfortable, so let me pretend to be something that I'm not or amplify this version of myself so that I won't be the, quote, different person in the room. It just, these kinds of things make you not want to be different. We try to dilute a lot of who we are to do this, to present somebody that doesn't encompass every part of who we are. But what can we do to show up more authentically every day? Well, I'm a huge advocate for therapy. My therapist has been an amazing help helping me navigate and process the trauma of assimilation. And I am raising bicultural kids and I think that is also super important for me to be able to navigate white spaces because my my husband is white and be that bridge for uh, my own culture and to really educate and in order to do that like therapy is the place to really have those those open and honest conversations where I can uh, also move forward. So I'm always an advocate for therapy and having a therapist that can help navigate through a lot of these emotions, especially because we're taught that emotions are bad or um, that there are faults for feeling negative emotions. So that is my first tip 
Um, and these are like really broad, broad tips. Uh, second is finding at least one or two people that you can uh, be honest with and to start forming that community, whether it's in the workplace or in the home uh, or just like your closest friends and say like, you know, this is, this is how I'm realizing life is for me. I need help. I need accountability to, or I just need to bounce ideas off of you, how I can respond when something like this happens, because we can rant and we can be frustrated and we can be annoyed at the situations that we're put in. But if we don't put the the words in place to make change, like it's gonna keep happening. That's how I got to where I was with this wedding. Like it just kept happening and I kept ignoring it, kept thinking, oh, that's just how it is. But it wasn't until I actually got the language to to educate even my kids. Like, okay, this is what you can say. This is how it made you feel. So communicate that with them when they make an insensitive comment, tell them why it's wrong. Yes, it's exhausting to constantly be doing the work, but it will give you such freedom and it will give you the confidence to continue being who you are in the workplace or in just life in general. So those are the two main things, like have that um, support from a therapist, but also find that community that you can talk to and who is also going to be like, yeah, you know what? I've had those same comments said to me, this is what I said, or you know what, it's not right. What are we going to do to stop it? Um, I think community is huge. And then also taking some time for yourself and really thinking through the things that have really caused you hurt in the past. What are the lies that you have been told and have believed about yourself and your culture? that are not true. So for example, for me, it's not true that I, all Mexicans are going to be going to Mexico to drink and do te tequila shots for spring break. For me, I took that and I'm like, well, how can I educate people? How can I show Mexico in a way that is rich historically and is beautiful how can I do that and start re-educating myself and other people? So I think those are the, the three tips, therapy, community, and then really taking um, some time to self-reflect on the things that have hurt you in the past so that you can get clear on how to undo the lies. It's exhausting to do the work, but if the result is that you get to be confident in the spaces you're in, maybe it's worth doing over time for Therapy, community, and time to reflect about the things that have hurt you in the past to help undo the lies. Maybe that's what each one of us can do day in and day out. And I want to connect this back to my framework around public speaking, which is reflect, connect, share. The reason I ask people about the very first time that they remember public speaking is because that's that reflection piece. That informs how we think about public speaking today. Of course, along the road, it's things like being in the workforce that make you think about public speaking in a different way that make me make you lose connection with your confidence and who you are as a person. But that initial contact is always, I think, a really good way of setting the foundation for your experience with the art of public speaking. And at the same time, self-doubt always creeps up on us, right? Somehow, some way, it comes back. What do we do when that doubt creeps up on us? How can we get ourselves out of that funk? Oh my gosh, this is like every day. I mean, this work is hard and it's like, oh, okay, not every day, but often. And I think that I need to step away from the computer. I need to step away I usually will go find my kids and like just chat with them for a few minutes. I'll go 
outside, I'll take my dog out for a walk just to get my, clear my head. And then I, and this is through therapy. I've, I've learned how to pinpoint the feelings that I'm feeling and then where it's coming from. So it kind of takes it and puts it in a more like not internal reality, but okay, let me talk about it and then understand that it's, it's not real. Like these feelings that I'm feeling stem from something that I heard when I was a younger child. And so it has no, nothing to do with me now. Um, another thing I do is I'll reach out to a few friends and just say like, hey, uh, I'm having trouble. Like, this is really frustrating me. I'm feeling discouraged. I want to just quit everything and they will hype me up. And then I'll be like, okay, okay. That paired with like taking a break from the work, whether it's five, 10, 15 minutes. Sometimes I recently had a friend tell me like, just take a whole day off because I am always working. Sometimes you just need to take some time off. And that's something that is not like told to us as like immigrants, first generation, second generation. It's not a mentality that was passed down that it's okay to take a break. And so that uh, someone giving me permission is like sometimes that, that little push that I need or else I would not take breaks at all. Uh, so those are, are the two things, um, taking a break, whether it's a short break or a longer break, and then having some people hype you up. Having people to hype you up. It's having also almost a separation between even your in your friend groups, right? I know that I like it when, for example, every day I always am thinking about Chats with Yvonne and our platform here and how I can get more people to love public speaking, right? But sometimes you need a break from that. And it's nice to have friends that are so not into public speaking that are, but though sometimes I'm like, come on, you got to love public speaking. But it's really nice to have people that are not in this content creator space or even in the space of my nine to five job or anything like that, right? It's cool to have friends that have different interests because not only do they serve to hype you up, but in moments when you need time away from the work that you do on the daily, they're not going to want to talk to you about it, right? You can talk to your friends about things that are different than what you do every day. I want to take this moment to thank Karina for being a guest on our podcast. These conversations are important because this is what goes through our mind every single day. We may not vocalize it often, no one would know, but we go through experiences that either make us feel like we have to hide parts of our identities to coexist with people in certain spaces, or we find those moments where, like Karina at the wedding, we're like, okay, basta, that's it. I get to be who I want and show up how I want from this moment forward. It takes work, but it's possible. And like Ariana said during our last episode, rest is essential. You don't have to do it all at once. You're not expected to. Again, gracias Karina for being who you are and for doing the work that you do. If you don't already, follow her on Elevating La Cultura on Instagram. Hire her for photography if you're in the Chicago area. Let her help you tell your story. There were so many moments throughout this conversation where I felt seen. I may not have experienced life in the same way that Karina did, but that doesn't matter because her sharing her story made me feel like, wow, we really all have the same thoughts. We really all go through this in different versions, right? We all go through the same things of feeling like we can't fully be ourselves and having a community where we can talk about it and when we can normalize the learning and unlearning that is required for us to show up authentically, I think that's freaking beautiful. And I hope that you all feel that we are not only creating that space in, on Chats with Yvonne, but that as you are reconnecting with who you are and where you want to go and who you want to be, that along the way, you're also realizing that your story is important to tell and that your st story deserves to be on stages. It deserves to be heard by people. But not only that, that your story can quite literally change someone's life and liberate them to share their own story. And when we do that, we're creating this domino effect of liberation. You're not a public speaker like them. You're a public speaker like you. You're not meant to be like them. You're meant to be like you. Tu cultura es tu poder. Thank you everybody for tuning in. Until next time.